Hello, this is Dr. Garrett Castleberry, Program Director for Communication, Media, and Ethics here at Mid-America Christian University. I am here with a short video that is part of our Media Culture and Social Influence uh, Week 3 Mini Lecture Series. And this week, what I want to do is incorporate some of our student discussion questions that came in as part of, uh, uh, I believe, Assignment 1 in Week 2. And so one of the things we're doing with this course is we're working on rewarding those reading habits and processing that information, um, trying to come to some strong conclusions about uh, why why, why these readings matter and what we can uh, use them for, do with that information, that knowledge, uh, once we acquire it. And um, as we continue to refine our discussion questions, uh, the stronger they become, the more integral a role they can play in how we interact and talk about the content. So, I have uh, printouts of your discussion questions. What I've done is highlighted the ones that I feel like we are best equipped to um, dive into from a traditional mass communication mode, right? This one uh, to many form of communication. And so I'm going to address these and, um, you, you know, th there is no claim that I have a infinite wisdom of the universe, an ability to answer all things uh, fully, and, uh, uh, um, but I will uh, do, the, do the best I can to speak to them and continue that process of dialogue so often uh, what we need is, are these processes of um, dialogue, of inquiry, of investigation, of research, of critical thinking, of circulating ideas over and over again until we can come up with palpable solutions that 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 seem to answer those 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 questions that push us. All right, so I'll do my best here and recognize uh, we we're on a bit of a. What do you call it? A uh, countdown on the timer here. So um, I will get to as many as I can, and uh, uh, we'll we'll just see how many we can we can work through here. All right. So I don't know how eye contact is going to work with uh, with with a lot of direct reading. So I can either like hold it like this or whatever. Um, but let let's jump into some of these questions. Okay. Jared has some excellent questions for us, and uh, I'll do my best to provide as stimulating, if not also entertaining a response as possible, um, because, you know, learning should be fun or whatever. So, Jared asks, and he doesn't hold back, right? He's like, some of you all doing amazing work and pulling no punches here with your questions, so uh, we'll, we'll see what we can get here. He asks, how important are artifacts and texts when used in media? Why so? Well, uh, it depends on their uses, right? Um, the, the importance <laughs> depends on what, to what end. Um, however, we can also recognize when we're talking about cultural artifacts or texts, the, these, these could be the individual pieces that make some other whole, or they could be the actual end product, right? A thing like a painting or a film or a radio show or, you know, whatnot. And these are, uh, I mean, these texts, uh, media artifacts create the building blocks to convey meaning, right? So um, they, in essence, are the way we create and share culture now. Um, um, so many of these texts, including the ones that seem very, I don't know, just playful and meaningless or whatever, these, these are the modern myths of, of our society, of our age. And so they even though we consume them, you know, the, as the saying or the joke goes, like popcorn, like candy, they still have that uh, recurring impact on us, right? It's subtle impressions that they might make. And the impressions could be immediate, like, oh, this, this, this feels good for me to sit and relax and watch this, like, sporting event or whatever. But they can also have powerful impacts, right? It's like, oh, I now love this sport so much that I will, you know, do 
I will move anything out of my schedule to make sure I attend or view, screen this this sporting event as it as it happens, as as it comes around. Um, no no price is too high for me to secure a ticket or uh, pay for a babysitter or you know decorate my lawn in this in the memorabilia relating to you know this cultural event. And so it, you know media artifacts. Uh, do serve this foundational purpose in our lives. Another great question. Commanding speakers in the Greek Empire had an awesome responsibility um, to their audience. How do you feel this compares to modern speakers today? Now, this would be a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a complex answer, uh, in that I would refer us to to some other readings. Uh, there's an excellent book. Let me see if it's on the shelf here. I'm looking, I'm looking. I see one. Uh, that one, where's it? Oh, this one. Okay. James Herrick wrote an amazing book, uh, The History and Theory of Rhetoric. And so rhetoric can be a complex, if not convoluted, a history of theories and ideas about uh, what initiated as maybe oratory or writing styles, but really has grown, evolved into so much more, uh, would that refers to Barry Brummett's Rhetoric of Popular Culture as Exhibit A in demonstrating that. Um, but Herrick does an, a fantastic job synthesizing the history of, of rhetoric or who, who we call or who we recognize as rhetoricians um, and this information can be valuable. Um, there is an era where they talk about the second sophistics, right? The sophists, if you recall that term from maybe philosophy or some some, some other class. But uh, there was a point in time in which uh, there, in Greek and and in, in Roman culture, they would they started to celebrate and indulge in oratory, aka public speaking, uh, indulge in it, kind of take it in as entertainment, like take it in for its own sake. And uh, I mean, in some ways this is a precursor to uh, contemporary media in some forms, right? Uh, the way we can consume things like 24 hour news channels, right? It's like, Nom, 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 these talking heads telling me exactly what I want to hear, bringing on that guest I love or I love to hate or I love it when they bring their opinion. And then the other people that disagree that make up the majority of that show will just like beat them down and clearly we're all right and clearly someone else is wrong. You know, we're getting a kind of entertainment aesthetic out of some of these types of uh, uh, oratory styles. And that was something they... Uh, that 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 the rhetoricians were warning against, right? Saying this can be a dangerous thing, and indeed uh, that that lesson has not has not gone away. Um, and so another thing that comes to mind when I think about the modern speakers today. Uh, Guy Deport wrote an important book in the early 80s called Society of the Spectacle, right? And the es essence of that theory is we live in um, in a society that's that's sort of like entertainment saturated, right? That we really are kind of uh, evolving technologically into that, into a kind of mass media culture. And that has ramifications, right, um, on a number of fronts. And that's what courses like this and future future offerings uh, are, are about. We're trying to investigate this and dig into it, better understand it. And so it's, it's a lot to unpack in short form. Another book that comes to mind is uh, Jean Baudrillard's Sim Simulacrum and Simulation, uh, another text coming out of that early 80s era of, uh, of critical writing. And this is, uh, this is that idea that, um, that we, we are also a society that's sort of a copy of a copy, right? And we're, we're struggling to understand or recall that the, the original version of some idea. Uh, another student in our class, Megan, I believe, was, was exploring these concepts in her own writing and, and talking about how there is this uh, tension out there of whether or not millennials will hang on to uh, some of our knowledge, some of our information, some of our terms or ways of thinking, ways of acting. And uh, there, there's an accuracy there. And that speaks also to this, this idea of, you know, simulacrum. And, and we go through these cycles that kind of 
once upon a time there's a kernel of an idea and it continues to evolve and so we have to be careful of that when we're thinking about consuming or writing about media and think about its influences you know what 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 not only are its influences but what it was its message and this this ties back to one of our key readings right Stuart Hall's encoding decoding and and there's the idea that we can decode in multiple ways right so there's no one perfect answer to something um, in terms of its interpretation and that's not this is not some preachy uh, some preachy you know platform or where, where I'm trying to advocate complete uh, I'm gonna throw out another communication term here cultural relativism and we understand there could be dangers to uh, cultural relativism or, 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 or rather just complete relativity right this can lead to indifference it can lead to apathy on on, on a mass scale um, but we we do need to recognize uh, the impacts we face right okay I'm gonna hit another a couple more of these questions looks like we're gonna turn this into like a multi-part of video series here uh, working through your your excellent student questions um, but let me see what I can do before uh, before we cut off part one of question mark right number of entries how do, 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 do how is it that Arthur Asa Berger drew his conclusions about the potential readers of his book um, you know and so how, how can he be confident in, in the conclusions he came he comes to uh, you know, this is this is a, a reasonable question, and I think there's a, a, a palatable uh, response here. Uh, Arthur Berger's a very, he's been around the block, right? He's been around for a long time, decades of experience in higher education, and as an author, he's been writing books for for decades, and uh, so he has experience in higher education and has a, a strong grasp and understanding of well, who is the average undergraduate student, you know, and what. What is what does that age bracket look like? What are those kinds of uh, you know consumption styles? I'm sure he's engaging with them, uh, and so on. And now, technically, he's he's now retired, but but uh, he, uh, you know I I think he's aware enough. But also recognize, think about the publisher, a publisher's uh, motive, right, uh, is to know their demographics, is to know who they're producing an artifact, a text for, right, a book. And so they're going to, you know, they're working in synthesis to try to get uh, the message to as focused an audience unit as possible. So just because you, so you know, occasionally we'll have students that feel like they may or may not belong to that demographic, we recognize the demographic of student is something that is, we're collapsing that traditional idea of, well, a college student is always, uh, must always be, you know, 18 to 23 or something like that. We recognize that's, that's not really a term in play. And so I don't, I think the, the, the trusting through these reading processes, um, the, the messages here, they speak to us across, across those demographic boundaries and not something to, to, to worry about too much. Um, really quick, I'm not going to go into heavy detail here, but the question about what is it about Marxism that is so appealing to some people? Hey, I get that. I definitely, you know, this is a buzzword and I feel like uh, probably Karl Marx himself would argue many people are misquoting or mis, you know, using his his ideas for their for their purposes. And sometimes we get into that kind of entanglement in when we're dealing with theory, right? Especially if it's if it's interpretive in nature. But just recognize uh, Marx uh, works so well, and a lot of writers always go back to him because you know one he's kind of a foundational critical thinker in the modern society, um, and then also he's a thinker outside the box kind of person right so he's presenting ideas uh, arguably a much weightier situation but he's creating uh, ideas and frameworks for understanding how society functions and what he's doing is trying to shine a light on on problematic areas and so his his critical lens as we would uh, identify it is useful because we can reapply that kind of critical lens we also might call Marxist thinking or Marxist thought to diverse kinds of contemporary issues and problems. So just because, uh, we, well, we always want to be open to the possibility that we can still gain insightful commentary and terms and, and these types of insights, 
even if we don't necessarily you know agree with the master text so back with more momentarily uh, from our uh, fantastic student discussions